How small is the number of those who keep their affections fixed on God alone? The saints look more at God than at all that is God's. They say, we desire not thine, but thee, or nothing of thine like thee. This is a quote coming to you from the Treasury of David. In this broadcast, we are continuing the theme of resolutions as found in the book of Psalms. In this particular broadcast, we will deal with resolution number 58, as found in Psalm 18.1, which says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now, before getting into this teaching, we want to go back to the opening quote and think about it for a minute. Think about what is being said here. Notice what the treasury of David said. How small is the number of those who keep their affections fixed on God alone? How, how small is the number? That's rather alarming. But when you look at the church today, you would almost have to agree with it. And then they went on to say, the saints look more at God than at all that is God's. Now, true saints, that's how they act. They look more at God than at all that is God's. They say, we desire not what you could give us, but we desire you. Okay, let me ask you, is this true? Is this true of the present day saints? Is this true of you? Are you looking more at God than all that is God's? Are you truly saying, I desire not what you have or what you could give me, but I desire you. Now, I want you to go with me for a minute over to Psalm 73, 25. And here we have Asaph speaking. He said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Here Asaph is declaring that he desires nothing either in heaven or in earth, except God alone. He had taken God for his portion in reference to both worlds, whether it be in earth or in heaven. He said, whom have I in heaven but thee? And you know, this is the cry, or should be the cry of God's saints. This is the cry of God's true saints, and it should be our cry as well. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Jesus is not only better than all on earth, he's more excellent than all in heaven. Who is to me in the heavens? There is no one there that can be compared with Jesus. No one can do for me what Jesus can do. No one can meet and satisfy my needs as Jesus can. No one can be to me what God is, what a God must be. And let me just stop here and interject this for my Catholic friends, that it is very anti-biblical and anti-scriptural to call on Mary, look to Mary, or the dead saints. Here you see where Asaph said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? We are not to love, adore, or have affection toward Mary, toward dead saints, toward anybody in heaven but Jesus. We are not to pray to anyone but Jesus. Pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Asaph said, Whom have I in heaven but thee. And then he went on to say, and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. What he was saying is, Jesus, 
You are all sufficient. Besides you, I have no delight on earth. You meet and satisfy my needs. All my happiness is in you. There's nobody on earth that could be substituted in your place. You, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Then we go over to Psalm 18.1, which is our main text. And we find David had the same sentiment when he said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. He had the same sentiment as Asaph. Here we find David uh, uh, giving forth this fixed resolution where he said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. I'm going to do this. No matter the price, the sacrifice, I am determined I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Not only would he love the Lord now, but he was resolved to do it forever. The treasury of David said, it is, it is wrong to make rash resolutions. But this, when made in the strength of God, is most wise and fitting. You know, just to go around saying, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Uh, it's not good. It's wrong to make rash resolutions. But this one is very important. It's crucial that we do make it. But you can't hold back and say, well, I'm, I don't think I can do this. Well, notice how David how he said it. He said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. He knew that in himself he could not accomplish it, but he would strive to do so, leaning on the strength of the Lord. Then he would be able to do it, and so can you. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now, those words are intensely forcible. And he's talking about a love of the deepest kind. Uh, with a strong, hearty affection will I cling to you, Lord. From the bottom of my heart, uh, in uh, the most affectionate way, dearly, entirely, fervently, with the greatest intensity, I will love you, O oh Lord. Now let me ask you, who is doing this today? Are you, are you striving to love the Lord in this manner? I will love thee, O Lord. God is the true object of our love. And he should be the first object, the worthy object, and the chief object. John Trapp's commentary said this, Nothing must we love above God or so much as God, much less against God. Nothing, nothing must we love above God or as much as God, and of course, not against God. We love God. We love him because he first loved us. He has poured out his mercies on us, He's been so merciful, and every day his mercies are new every morning. And it's all because of his love for us. His love, he pours out his mercies because of his love. And the result, or what we do in return, is we give him our love. We return the favor by loving him. He saved us from death and hell. Our response should be, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. He saved you from sickness. Your response should be, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. He bestowed grace on you when you were in trouble, when you were going through a storm, when you were going through the fiercest trial of your faith. He comforted you in a time of loss or sorrow. Your response should be, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Do we love him because he's infinitely great? Certainly, he's deserving of our love for that reason, but we especially love him because he is so good to us. He is worthy of our love. 
David said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now, in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, and then going on to 13, we find out that God said to the children of Israel, he said, I require of you. What he was saying is, because I have poured out my mercies on you, that this is what I require. This is what I ask of you. Now, here is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? Because he poured out his mercies, he's been so good, he requires of us. He's asking, requesting of us that we will love him in return. But what does that love look like? How do I love him? How do I express this love? Well, we find the answer to that in Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. First of all, you... You love him by fearing him. Fear the Lord thy God. What that means is you have a reverential trust for him or trust in him with a hatred of evil. You receive his truth, accept his law. You fear to offend him. You acknowledge his authority. You stand in awe of his power and you dread any separation from him or dread his wrath. This is how you love him. Another way of showing your love to him is by walking in all his ways. Now notice uh, Moses did not say by standing still. He said by walking in all his ways. Not walking in your own ways or walking in the ways of the world, walking the ways of your family, walking the ways of the people around you. No, you walk in all his ways. You follow the course of conduct that he prescribes. You uh, follow the path of duty that he's directing you to. This is how you show your love toward him. Another way is by serving him with all your heart and with all your soul. Love always prompts to service. So he shows you a way or an opportunity to serve him. He tells you, do this. I want you to serve me in this capacity, in this way. And what you do is you perform it with all your heart. You do it cheerfully and with a good will. You're hearty and zealous about it. You devote yourself to his honor, put yourself under his government, and you advance his interests. And lastly, how do you express your love to him? By keeping his commandments. And we find that in Deuteronomy 10, 13. You keep his commandments. You make his revealed will or his word your rule in everything. You, you back up everything with the word of God. You perform all he prescribes and you forbear all he forbids. And this is how you love him. Wherever love fills the heart. It expresses itself in the life. And the measure and the extent of your love is with all your heart. David said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. What does the Lord thy God require of you? He's requiring, he's requesting, asking of you that you would love him in return for his goodness and his mercies. The way you do that is You fear him. You walk in all his ways. You serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And you keep his commandments. You do what he says. But in closing, we want to share with you that there are always hindrances that you will come up against to that love. As soon as you resolve in your heart, I'm going to love you, O Lord, my strength. I can tell you assuredly that Satan will bring hindrances to that love. What are they? First of all, the biggest one is self. This is so common in the world 
that it makes the times that we are living in very perilous. Love of self. This excludes all love for others. This is where you become so eminently selfish. Everything is holy for yourself. You make self the central and the leading object of your life. And you trample on everything that would interfere with that. So your love to God and to the saints is only in pretense. You do all to selfish ends. You're always looking for glory and applause from, from men. And you ascribe all you do to yourself, to your own uh, industry. Look what I have done. Look at me. And it's self as is a great hindrance to loving the Lord. Another one is pleasure. The Bible even says in 2 Timothy 3, 4, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. There is nothing that destroys, shuts out, or naturally extinguishes your love for God like pleasure. Living for pleasure. And this is the characteristic of the great part of the world right now, is living for pleasure, having no serious pursuits, and breaking uh, no restraints that interfere with your amusements. You prefer pleasure to the friendship of your creator. Another one that's very big is the world. This, the world is the usurper of your affection. First John 2.15, John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, when the world becomes your God, you give it first place in your heart. You love it as your portion. You live for it. You make the world your treasure. You put your trust in the world instead of in God. And you're influenced by the maxims and feelings of the world. It's a hindrance to your love to God, for God. And lastly, money. The love of money is the root of all evil. When you get to the place where you do nothing but for money, and you're for what you can get, and for keeping what you have, that's a hindrance to you loving the Lord. Asaph said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. This is the cry of the true saint of God. Hence, the saint of God will make it his top resolution, not a rash, rash resolution, but a sobering and a serious resolution I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now let me ask you, have you made this your resolution? Is there anything hindering you from loving God as you should? What are you going to do about it? Our time is up for today's broadcast, but I encourage you, stay tuned for our next teaching as we continue our study of resolutions as found in the book of Psalms. This is Connie Giordano with Walking in Truth Ministry, praying that you will recognize any and all hindrances which are standing in the way of your loving Jesus as he so deserves. In his name I pray, amen.